Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Billy Keels, the host of the Going Long Podcast. Freedom. Every week I'm going to be here interviewing the absolute best in the business as it relates to real asset investing, as well as real Main Street investors. We're going to be having conversations where you can listen in and that's going to help you to continue on your path to education so that you feel much more comfortable as well as confident in investing long distance. So make sure that you, uh, that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Make sure that you're liking it as well because that way you can get every single episode as soon as it comes out. And by the way, don't forget to leave today's episode a five-star review. Let's go ahead and listen to today's conversation. Welcome to the Going Long Podcast, and where we're here to help to educate you so that you can gain more control and be able to have more control of investing beyond your backyard. I'm your host, Billy Keels, and today we have a very special show for you, especially if you're interested in understanding more about the, the retail space as it relates to investing in real estate, understanding more about some of the key concepts and, and things that you look for when you're wanting to invest. Uh, we have an absolute superstar in that space that's going to be with us today. Uh, we have Mr. Michael Flight, and uh, he's going to talk to us a lot about how you can actually go out, understand more about the retail space. And this guy is phenomenal. So, uh, Michael, I want to welcome you to the show, man. Hey, Billy, how's it going? I really thank you for inviting me here. And uh, we met uh, a few years ago, and uh, I, I've just been really impressed by you, especially the way you dress. I'm like, that guy <laughs> is Mr. Style. And then when I found out, it's like, oh, he's European. That's how, that's where he gets the flair from. So. Right. Living in Europe for a while, man, this is, this is one of the things that, uh, that, that does, I guess it makes an impact on you. It makes an impact on you. So, I mean, listen, so there's so many things I want to jump into because I want to really have the going long listeners and viewers soak up as much knowledge uh, from you as possible. There's so many things to talk about. Uh, I don't even think it's possible that you have been doing, like for those of you especially that are watching, that you've been in this for over 33 years. Doesn't even seem possible. Um, know that you got started uh, back in 1985. You and your brother got into some, some investing, so hopefully we can find out more about that. Uh, knowing that you also have an enthusiasm for mentoring and educating, something I've learned from you firsthand. We've had a chance to travel different places in the U.S. I've learned a lot from you. Want to help have others uh, learn from you. You're a best-selling author. You are a broker owner, and uh, you co-founded Concordia and, uh, in 1989. And also, man, with, the, with that experience, you've been through the ups and downs of the SNL. You've also lived through the dot-com. You lived through the Great Recession of 2008. And we have some really interesting times now. So I'm sure all of that experience is going to help you and others uh, as we move forward. So th these are just a couple of the highlights. But I always like to get you to tell a little bit about your story uh, because – as with any story, you've taken a number of different actions to get to the point where you are today as, a, as an experienced investor, a mentor, and coach. And Michael, if you could just help share with the Going Along listeners a little bit more about your story and some of the things that have helped you to get to this point uh, in your journey. Well, I've had uh, quite a few conversations with younger guys. Uh, we've got a lot of younger guys on our team right now. And they're all, I shouldn't say all, but they're, they're mainly below 35 years old. So um just it, it's been great because uh i've got a lot of scars on me from you know a few different uh downturns and uh you know projects that went exceptionally well and projects that didn't go I exceptionally well and uh so it's it, it's i i keep explaining to them like i've got a little different perspective on things and um especially in the middle of this, you know, lockdown, quarantine and all the rest of it. You know, I've been explained to it, it's like, this is kind of how things, you know, it's like a combination uh, in the United States of September 11th um, mixed with uh, the, you know, financial crisis. And I said, it's, it's very similar to when, you know, they let Lehman Brothers, you know, collapse and then mm. everything just, did that plus there's really no airplanes in the air so it's yeah. it's uh it, it, it's an unusual time we're, we're going to get through it like the, the world is going to get through it um you know but uh it, we're really i i don't want to say the word excited but we're excited about the future because you know we know that this isn't going to be forever and mm -hmm things are going to come out of this there's going to be some changes in the real estate industry there's going to be 
um, some distress in the real estate industry. Uh, there's going to be some people that just got into the real estate industry and unfortunately they're, they're not going to make it through. Um, and, uh, it's going to be tough times and it, but you know, I, I believe that there's a lot of hope, um, you know, in, in a lot of sunshine at the end of the tunnel. Wow. And there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. I definitely share that with you. I mean, I know that it can be the appearance that there's a lot of chaos. And as you said, that it can create opportunities. Those that had the right plans and are executing those plans are going to be able to survive. And um, there will probably be some or, or potentially many that, that don't. Um, and, and I want to get back to this thing of retail, right? And, and commercial the commercial space and, and shopping centers. And I know you have a philosophy that there's really kind of an evolution at, right. at any point in time around that. So maybe you could help us understand, just help to educate us a bit, Michael, in terms of this evolution that you see in retail, maybe some of the, um, the, the challenges that you may see and also some of the opportunities. Well, I just want to preface by the fact that I speak mainly from a U.S. Um, retail experience or a North American retail experience. So Canada and the U.S. are, are very similar. Mm -hmm. But uh, I go back to the, the 1800s when there was smaller towns and there was the general store. And then the Amazon, you know, dot com of its day was the Sears catalog and the Montgomery Wards catalog. And they were shipping stuff out directly to farmers on the plains and stuff. And then, you know, it grew to the fact that it's like, oh, if we're here, we can open up stores in these markets. Um, so in the United States, there's chain stores that, you know, have multiple locations in either different geographic regions of the United States or nationwide. Um, so to give you an example right now, uh, you know, everybody knows McDonald's and McDonald's is now worldwide and it's a worldwide chain. And I, I think they've got like 30,000 units or even more than that. Um, and so they're by far the largest, you know, hamburger chain probably in the world. Um, but that, you know, started out in the 1950s and it grew and they've evolved and they said, hey, we, you know, um, one of their franchisees, as a matter of fact, and I think the 1960s said we're paying for this real estate for 24 hours a day and we're only using, you know, lunch and dinner time. And so let's add breakfast. And then, um, you know, they also somebody added a drive through. And so everybody and now, as you and I were discussing earlier, um, you know, drive through is probably like 70% of some of these, you know, now it's a little bit different for Europeans because Europeans don't really understand the drive through um, concept. Right. And, and how much, you know, we in the United States live in our car, you know, and so, uh, but that's even uh, in terms of like pharmacies and, you know, you've got the pharmacia and, you know, the, the, the all over uh, Europe as well. Here, uh, the, the large pharmacy chains are CVS, um, Rite Aid, and Walgreens. And they've kind of like uh, gotten rid of most of the smaller uh, local guys and their, their national chains. And they decided probably 20 years ago that um, they want drive through too. So originally you'd always have a, a supermarket, in a shopping center and you'd have a, a pharmacy and that would be your neighborhood shopping center. And so the pharmacy chains went out and they did their own real estate. So they take 10,000 to 15,000 square feet. I don't know what that translates into meters because I'm not really good at math. Um, uh, but uh, so they, you know, have these freestanding units and they wanted the freestanding units so that number one, they were more convenient or convenience oriented. So they're right out on the street. So people driving by can see them. Plus they want the drive through. And so now most recently with this um, coronavirus, uh, Walgreens is doing and CVS are both doing drive through testing. So that people can, you know, drive up and do the drive through testing. So they, they've been, you know, really, um, this has been a boon to them. And the other thing is uh, Walgreens just announced that they're also doing drive through groceries. So you could either order online um, 
or, you know, uh, just go right there and, and they'll, you know, pick the, the groceries out and, and get them to you. And that's kind of been an evolution from what, uh, before Amazon, there was a but there was the dot com crash, and there was a few guys that tried to do delivery groceries, and it didn't work. Uh, Amazon kind of has perfected their system, but Amazon also figured out that they can't do just strictly delivery grocery. So they went out and bought Whole Foods. So Amazon also owns Whole Foods. So they have brick and mortar, and they have a combination of brick and mortar and delivery. Um, Walmart, who is by far the largest retailer in the United States and probably the largest retailer in the world by sales volume, they're just massive. And uh, they saw that, you know, Amazon was doing this. And so Walmart started doing not only home delivery, but Walmart um, actually has such a sophisticated thing that, you know, you can order online, you can see whether it's in the store. Um, theoretically you can their delivery service so if you drive up to where their pickup is they'll get the thing out to you within 10 seconds and you can do everything online and they'll just you know put the stuff in your car so um I, that's how retail is evolving it, it evolved from uh you know individual stores to downtowns to shopping centers to large regional enclosed malls, which your uh, listeners are probably familiar with in, because they've got some great malls in Europe. So I really am impressed by the European malls. Um, and now it's going towards, you know, getting away from the malls in the United States um, because those are, are expensive to operate. It's going more towards what we call open shopping centers or strip centers where people can drive up to the front of the store um, and it's very similar to where you guys have like a, a supermarket there or something where you can, there's a little bit of parking there and everything else. And then a lot of retail is going to freestanding now. No, you know, and, that, and I think that, so, you know, and you've given us a really great historical perspective and even the evolution, right? When you're, when we're talking about retail, all the way from the original general store to places like Montgomery Ward and, and, and things like that. And then even being able to see where retail not only when you talk about names like Amazon, who everybody thinks is not a brick and mortar, has actually part is taking advantage of the opportunity that exists in the freestanding retail space, uh, which is great. And then also the retail, when you have that retail space, you're able to adapt, not only using technology to understand how closely people are getting to the, to, to the actual retail location, but also being able to better serve uh, the, the the end customer, whether that be someone driving through the the drive through at McDonald's, if you're in in North America, or even in any of the locations that have a McDonald's or a McDonald's and drive through possibility, to even seeing where the drugstores or the pharmacies are adopting a very similar type of philosophy, and they're being able to better serve their their customers. So I think that's a great perspective to help us understand just how vibrant the retail space is ha, or has been is and will continue to be um as we move forward so um and michael yeah, one, and what, I, I definitely want to clarify one thing on the amazon yeah. they figured out that they need the brick and mortar and most pure play retailers have figured out that they do need the internet retailers figured out that they do need the brick and mortar so um retailing in the future is going to be a combination of um, brick and mortar online in delivery it's really going to be about a complete service spectrum for, um, you know, your customer. Which is great. A lot of they, a lot of times they talk about the omni-channel experience, right? Yes. Being able to know yes. where they are at all times and, and whether it's online, offline, um, on your laptop, on your mobile phone, or actually in the, uh, in the brick and mortar store. So it's a, it's a great, uh, great way to tie it all together. Now you, you I mean, you, you're, you have a wealth of experience. I mean, you talked about North America. I also happen to know that you've spent a lot of time understanding the European uh, market as well. So maybe you could tell us about some of the things that you see as, as opportunities because you are someone who um, actually does lots of traveling to really get a much broader perspective to continue to create value uh, for yourself and for your investors. Well, I am going to say I'm very weak on European um, investments. We'd, we'd love to be doing more European investments and we'd, we'd like to grow our, our business that we are because we, we really like the market. Um, but we have 
over the years done extensive travel in the market because uh, a lot of successful stores in the United States started out as, as European stores um, and vice versa. You know, some successful um, United States stores, a lot of them have, you know, gone into successful European malls. Um, I think where the, the main difference is, is that uh, Europe still has some really good walkable downtowns. And so you see I, in the United States, there's a few walkable and, and good streetscape um, in, in, in street, high street retailers uh, versus when you go to a city like London or you go to a city like where you're at in Barcelona and stuff like that. There, it, it's almost it, what we would kind of consider a, a mall already. So they have to build that environment. You go to California and it's got a fake Spanish mall and it's got all the outdoor plazas and stuff. It's like, but you know, in Barcelona, it's homegrown, you know, in, in Italy, it, it's homegrown. It's like, it, it's already there. It's organic. And you know, it, it's, I believe a, a, a slightly better experience um, because it's, it's a little bit less fake. And the, the first time I ever went to Italy, I was really disappointed at like how dirty, how bustling, how you know chaotic it was, um, because I was used to like a, a Las Vegas experience where everything is like <laughs> you know sanitized and it's you know clean and it's it's just but it's all fake too, you know. <laughs> and then the next time. I went, my wife got really offended, but I said, I've lowered my expectations. And she's like, you know, oh, I can't believe it. Like, no, no. I'm like, I, I just am experiencing, you know, what this is. And it's a, it is really a truly better experience because it is a real experience, you know, versus um, the other one tries to, you know, make the experience and it's pretty successful, but the real experience is, is way, way, way better than, you know, the, the fake experience. And, and so, you know, so this in the, in the experiences that you have, right. And this is one of the, yeah. the main values that I be, that I see you bringing, because not only do you know, and are an expert in the North American market, you are able to juxtapose that with what you've seen on your European travels, understanding more about the market. And, and I, I want to bring it back to a point. So considering a lot of our going on listeners and viewers, they really want to understand more about this retail space. So we, we talked a little bit more about the, the, the experience side, some of the relationship stuff, but can you kind of help us understand? So let's say we want to understand more about retail. What are some of the criteria that we should be thinking about as we start to look at retail as a potential investment opportunity? In the U S um, retail is mainly about traffic. Um, so it, in, in that traffic is vehicle traffic. Um, and in Europe, uh, a lot of the traffic is is uh, pedestrian traffic, but it is also vehicle traffic because there are, you know, some really good um, you know retail streets with with vehicles on them. So it's really about you know how much traffic is there. So that's the first thing we look at. Um, we also look at different tenant types. Um, so there were tenant types earlier on in my career that were you know fantastic tenants that, that are no longer around. And I'm going to just mention like Woolworth, which is a fine and dime store and um, even some of the venerable department stores and stuff. And so we look at now retailers that are going to be um, not only uh, essential retailers and create daily or weekly tra traffic trips. Uh, for example, the drugstores I was talking about, um, the, the grocery stores, uh, the tenants, what we have in the United States, which are, are now called dollar stores, but they were, you know, they're basically variety stores with food in them. Mm -hmm. Um, convenience oriented. We're also looking for, um, either tenants that, uh, create a, an entertainment experience. Like we just went back to with the, the European thing. And what we learned here in the United States is it's like, you need restaurants, you need a place to like, you know, it, it creates a place. And so we're looking for entertainment and um, food type of retailers, restaurant retailers. And uh, we're also, we really like, because United States is an automotive society, we like auto service uh, tenants. And then uh, what we've 
uh, in what the industry has dubbed medtail, which is medical type retailers. Um, so those are our dental retailers. Those are um, emergency um, uh, medical. So if somebody hurts themselves or you know it needs emergency medicine, but you know doesn't want to go to the hospital, the the emergency, what we call doc in the box, is is closer and more convenient. Um, and there's also medical retailers that are absolute necessity. Um, like the Vita Dialysis and Fresenius. And both of those are international companies. And so uh, Fresenius especially is in the European market. Um, and so people that need dialysis, you know, cause their kidneys have failed, um, those are excellent tenants and they've got good. And then the other issue that we look at um, is also what I forgot about. And the key difference between retail um, and residential is we have credit tenants. And so we look at the tenants credit and their corporate credit. So going back to like a gold standard corporate credit, you would look at McDonald's as, you know, one of your gold standard corporate credits. And, uh, there's, there's other tenants there, like these, uh, drug stores that I was talking about, you know, they're rated by the credit agencies. And so they can sell their bonds to the public market. Uh, but it also means that they have the financial wherewithal that um, even, you know, some of these tenants that, you know, might be closed for a month or two months, they've got, you know, the finances where they can carry that through. Um, and and then, Michael, Michael, is that something that you, so if, when you're looking at and you're evaluating new opportunities, that's something that you should be asking, who is the, who is the intent? Is that something that you would typically know if you're looking to uh, invest? Absolutely. In retail, you're not only underwriting the particular property that you're looking at. So can you drive in? Can you drive out? Can, is there access? Um, is there vehicles passing by it? Um, is it visible? Does it have a lot of signage? Because, you, you know, everywhere you want signage so people could see it. But the underlying fundamental, once you decide that it's a good property, or maybe you've decided from the opposite direction, um, you underwrite their credit. And so you want to make sure that their business plan and their uh, concepts are something that's going to be around because these leases are, are long-term leases. So they're typically- give us an, I was going to say, give us an idea of what a, you know, because I think a lot of us, when we're thinking about residential properties, we're thinking about a six month or a year long lease, maybe some places it's maybe five years. But give us an idea of when you talk about a lease- for a retailer? Right. With what the type of investment about? that um, a tenant would have to put into their, their store to do it, um, it's typically 10, um, sometimes you know 20 years. Uh, we've done leases that are 30 years long. Um, I have a Walgreens in a shopping center that uh, it was the original tenant for the shopping center in 1957. The lease was done when there was, we use zip codes in the United States. There were no zip codes, you know? And uh, so then we took that Walgreens, um, when they changed their business model and needed an, uh, you know, a drive-through, we moved them to the out parcel um, and we recast their lease. So they were already in the shopping center for more like close to 40 years. And so we did a new lease with them. So the firm term, uh, that they're guaranteed to be in there for is 30 years. And then they have options that they can extend every five years so that they actually control that parcel of land and their store for the, the, the total term is 60 years. Wow. I think that so when we so this is really getting to the point of starting to think about creating generational impact. I, yes. I think that that is yeah. absolutely phenomenal. I just want to give a quick recap. I mean, some of the things you talked about that we should be thinking about is traffic. Right. And specifically, when you talk about investing in North America and the U.S., we're talking about vehicle traffic. A lot of that can right. translate as well where there's foot traffic and a lot of maybe some of the urban centers and things like that. But you get both. Um, you also talked about the different tenant types that you have in terms of retailers talking about things like 
um, being being uh, oriented around convenience and also think, thinking about things like entertainment and also a concept that maybe many of us have not heard of is that med tail. So basically being able to look at medical and, and retail and thinking about those types of tenants as long term tenants when you are looking to um, when you're looking to invest or looking to to team with uh, with uh, with others, so I guess coming back to this whole thing about the generational impact, I know mm-hmm. that something and, and maybe starting to, to wrap things up that something that's really important to you and something when you're looking at this type of investment opportunity and you're having an impact, um, I know that you also really um, are into in, in being able to look how you can give back to a specific community when you are involved in a retailer. So maybe you could talk to us a bit about how this this retail investment has also allowed you to follow a passion of yours to be able to to give back into a number of different communities. I know you do things very much locally there in in the Chicago area and you're having an impact even wider than that. Yeah, um, you know what, I, I have been insanely blessed. Um, and you know, my life is just, uh, I, it's not that I haven't had any, you know, struggles, but we've been, you know, just, I, I, I've been blessed with, with wealth. I've been blessed with, you know, deciding to get into real estate. I've been blessed where I could make some money. And then, uh, one of the books and, you know, I'll, I'll mention this later on, but one of the books that one of my mentors gave me was a, a book called halftime. And it's like, when you're 40 years old, how do you change your life from success to significance? And mm-hmm. it's like, you've made this money now. And what can you do with that money to, to not only, um, you know, uh, create value for, you know, your generations and, and your kids and all the rest of it, but how can you make the world a better place? And so that's, you know, and I also realized that, uh, I, there was people that were in nonprofits that were asking me about my real estate expertise and that they had a lot of people that could give them money, but they didn't have my particular expertise. So, I mean, even, you know, with yours, you've got sales expertise, you've got tech expertise and you've got real estate expertise. I mean, you're the total package. That's what, you know, I'm, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, uh, but it's like, there's other talents that, you know, you could, you, you could give the people too. And so I, I started helping um, a few ministries in the city of Chicago with um, either um, rehabbing, you know, uh, neighborhoods to, to improve the neighborhoods and to, to increase uh, living, you know, uh, in, in flourishing communities. Um, and then through that, I, I met uh, a, a friend of mine who was a community organizer in the city of Chicago. And he came up to me, he goes, Hey, Mike, you're a business guy. We were at a, a luncheon together. And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, uh, I got these, uh, women in Romania and they, they need, they, they've been trafficked, you know, and it's, you know, a, a little bit of a hard story, but they need, you know, we're trying to create this, uh, I've got this, um, nonprofit organization where they're helping these women to do business out of their home. So, what kind of businesses can you, you know, help, can you help them start a business? I'm like, number one, I don't know anything about Romania. <laughs> number two, it's like, you know, it, inside the home businesses. But we um, actually, uh, through a, a friend of mine who, who does a podcast, he, you know, was doing, you know, different home-based businesses and things. So we actually um, paid for classes for them to take to do online marketing, like Amazon affiliate marketing and, um, how to do set up websites and, and all the rest of it. And Romania has great, you know, internet connectivity. And so we've helped them, you know, create a few businesses in, in one of them that one woman, uh, Elena needed extra, you know, money. And, uh, I, at the time was going to pay for a gym membership. I'm like, Hey, I'll uh, pay you a weekly thing if you hold me accountable. So, you know, um, it, it's worked out very well. I have to show her my workout or I have to show her how, how many kilometers I've walked per day. You know, so I average about six, sometimes up to, you know, 18, 20 kilometers, you know, a day oh, of, of wow. walking. Wow. And it's helped me really lose a lot of weight. And, you know, I get this because they don't, 
it's like me, would be me swearing in Spanish or something. The, the words don't mean anything. So I get these texts like, Hey, fat ass. I didn't get any, um, you know, <laughs> you gotta come back. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, you, you know, and I, and I think it's, this is great because you're able to use an area of your expertise. You've been blessed. You've been fortunate. And this is your way of being able to get back. And you, in, in, in this, investing in this particular asset area allows mm -hmm. you to do that because you're doing it on a larger scale. And I know you, you've done things at the foundation of economic freedom. I know you're doing things with the Chicago hope Academy as well. And I know we could go on and on and on. Um, but you, you've in this, in this conversation, Michael, you, I mean, you've really helped us understand from a historical perspective, uh, where real, where retail has played a role in, in real estate. Um, it's providing opportunities to create generational impact. You know, we can see today that it is something that it is part of the asset class that really has evolved and will continue to evolve. A lot of it's really focused on the individual and what can we provide with them in, in, a, in an area of convenience and an area of being able to uh, have a face-to-face -face contact. And that's something that will be around for, I guess, generations to come. So um, before we do wrap up though, and you've already kind of alluded to it, but I, I really want to wrap up with our, uh, with our going long three questions uh, to kind of wrap it, wrap things up and, and bring it home. So um, if you're ready for that, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm ready. All right, cool. So first question is really helping, un helping us to understand. Um, and I know you have European roots um, as well, but I'd like to know what is your favorite European city, either that you visited or that you want to visit? You know, my all time favorite city. Um, and I've been there a, a few times is Rome. Um, there's, there's great cities. And then the next city that I really, really want to visit because, um, Billy Keel said he's going to buy me dinner. And so it, and it's, I'm go, going to be there regardless this year. So we are going to be having dinner together in Barcelona. Awesome. Awesome, awesome. 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 But, um, for that. Rome is one of those things where it's like, they even have like super cool giant artwork and, in um, you know, fountains and stuff in an alley. I mean, it's like everywhere you turn. And, and I, I do, I, I do like it's you get the same thing with London too. London. It's just like every turn, there's just something historic and things like that. So I, I it's hard to, I, I love That's, Europe. We'll, we'll go yeah. with Rome. We'll go with Rome. We'll take okay. Rome. And, and we're looking forward to <laughs> Barcelona having dinner. So uh, yeah. second, second question is, um, so you've learned a lot just really interested in understanding from the what I guess was the biggest learning experience you've had so far um, in, in terms of uh, as a, as a, as a business owner, as a, as a real estate investor, um, kind of what was the biggest mistake and what was the learning that you took away from that? Um, well, I, uh, some of the biggest mistakes were getting outside of my area of expertise and then not bringing in the, the correct, people as part of the team to, to make it work. So that, that was um, the, the biggest mistake. And every time I've, I've lost money in any type of investment, it's usually been outside my area of expertise and then not having the right team members um, working with me. So we uh, have built a team around retail. We've been able to fluidly switch as the, the retail has evolved. And now we're um, switching once again and creating a, a, a fund. And we, we were working on the fund last year and um, the fund investments have proven out that uh, they're, it, it's more of a safe haven investment. It's for single tenant, triple net properties like we were talking about with the dollar stores, with the uh, med tail, with the um, drug stores and with uh, automotive service. So Okay. It, that's going to be a, a great uh, safe haven type of investment. So, um, and we are insanely familiar with that type of stuff. We've been doing that stuff, you know, for the last 30 years and uh, we have the team built up for it. So that's my, cool. my biggest mm -hmm. takeaway is having the team and, and knowing, a, having a little familiarity or being comfortable with somebody that knows what they're doing. Okay. So get outside of your zone. What you've learned yeah. is make sure you stay in your zone, your air ex expertise and get the right team around you. So we're going to wrap yes. it up with the last question, which is uh, talk to us about what is the favorite book that you like to recommend and why? Well, there's, 
there's two favorite books for real estate investment, especially with people that are, are just starting. Um, it's the uh, Re Millionaire Real Estate Investor by um, Gary, um, what's Gary's last name? Keller. Keller, G Gary Keller. Um, and then for um, just life, especially for guys like us or even guys that are getting into their um, 30s. And I've even recommended it to people that are, are younger just so they can start thinking about it and growing. But um, the, the the book that I it really has fundamentally changed my life the most. Um, and I, I, I probably first read it over 20 years ago, maybe 25 years ago was um, halftime by Bob Buford. Okay. Awesome. Fantastic. So we've learned a ton, a ton, a ton, and I am excited to be able to uh, stay in touch with you. And I'm sure that everyone that has listened and is watching, they also, Michael, they want to figure out how in the world can I get in touch with Michael? How quickly can I get in touch with him? So can you help everyone know what is the best way to contact you, to be in touch with you and to learn more from you? Well, we have contact forms on both of our uh, websites. The first website is concordiarealty.com and you can just go to the contact page there and that's very easy. Or libertyfund.io is the other website for the special triple net uh, fund that we've got. And then they can in email me individually at mflight at concordiarealty.com. That's M-F-L-I-G-H-T at C-O-N-C-O-R-D-I-A-R-E-A-L-T-Y.com. So, uh, Michael, I really appreciate you being here. We're going to include all of your contact information in the show notes. So make sure if you're watching us or you are listening to us, it'll be in the show notes. And uh, Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to help to educate everyone to uh, have more control over investing beyond their backyard. Thanks so much, Michael. Thank you, Billy. Wow, don't you love hearing from top-notch experts in the field? You know, when I was getting started, I really wish that I would have had access to such experts. And even more, I wish they would have given me like a really simple list of things to follow so that I could have gotten to my goals much faster and been much happier even sooner. So that's why I've created for you the seven things that you should avoid in order to be successful in long distance investing. And you can pick that up really easily by going to billykeels.com forward slash seven things to avoid. And also, if you liked today's episode, don't forget to leave a five star review. I'm looking forward to seeing you on our very next episode. So go out and make it a great day.